pray for our ongoing ministry with uh, Trail Life and American Heritage Girls and all of the ways in which we continue to reach out to our, uh, to our neighborhood, to our town, to the community in which God has planted us. Uh, we do have, I, I know the next one says discipleship study. I want to let you know that uh, Sam and I will be gone uh, Tuesday, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday morning for preacher's retreat. So if you try to reach us, it'd be best to probably text us and uh, or call and leave a voicemail for us, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. But uh, we do have preacher's retreat this week, so pray for the Bethel preachers as we're traveling. We will be back for our Wednesday night discipleship study, so we will still meet here at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening. And you can join us by Zoom. That is available. If you haven't done that, I encourage you to do so. Uh, that is something that we're making available for those who are unable to be here in person. Uh, and, of course, always look for the little recap. Look for the abbreviated notes in your, uh, in your email box. and Respond to those, if you will. That, that'd be great. Uh, slide number four. <sighs> Daylight savings time. This is our fall back. This is... The only reason that I still put up with spring forward is because of fall back. Uh, if you don't set your clocks back, you will be early for church. That's not a bad thing. You can, you can come early, better, better early than not, I guess. But yeah, come on. Uh, daylight savings time will end. Be sure next Saturday night to set your, set your clocks back one hour. Um, and that's also important because that's going to lead us into something else that's coming up next Sunday night. Um, it's uh, this time of year, again, around November the 1st. Today is, if you haven't already picked up on it, today is All Hallows' Eve. Uh, we typically know that as Halloween. But it is the day before All Hallows' Day or All Saints' Day. And so... The first Sunday in November, which uh, is a week from now, actually, it's, uh, it's next Sunday, uh, we will be having an evening service where we will uh, be remembering those who have passed on uh, in this past year. And uh, I encourage you to come next Sunday evening if you're able. I know it sounds morbid, it sounds sad, it sounds all of those things. It is an incredible celebration, and it is a great way to remember how God has been with us through all of the issues and all of the struggles and all of the things that we faced in this past year, uh, and to continue to pray for God's guidance in the year to come. So if you've never been to one of our All Saints uh, Sunday evening celebrations, I encourage you next Sunday evening to, uh, to come. It's 6 o'clock next Sunday evening, November the 7th. Be right here. Uh, while we're talking about November, we have another fellowship opportunity, and that's November the 14th. And that will be our um, Thanksgiving holiday celebration, and we'll also uh, talk about birthdays for the month of November. And that's uh, right after our morning service on November the 14th, and over in the fellowship hall, we will have a great meal, and I look forward to, uh, to that time together. Uh, one last thing I want to remind you all about the Bethel Women's Retreat, January the 21st through the 23rd. I know it's so far away in January. Yeah, that's not that far away. I mean, we're practically in November, so we have about two months. Be sure to, uh, uh, to talk to Cameron. Do you have any news, anything? Talk to Cameron after the service, and uh, she'll come up with something between now and then to tell you about the Women's Retreat. Is that fair? That's fair. All right, there you go. And uh, that will uh, be January 21st to 23rd in uh, Palestine. Palestine, Palestine, Palestine. There you go. Did I get it right this time? I always have to ask. There you go. For more information to view our recorded services, go to BethelMethodist.com slash Robinson. Any other announcements, anything else we need to know about this morning before we begin our service? Sorry, I thought Nora was trying to get my attention. There you go. <laughs> oh, I'm not moving now. As we come together this morning, we turn to the Psalms, those great hymns and, and prayers of the, of the church for so many, so many decades, centuries. And we hear this morning from the beginning of Psalm 119. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the way of the Lord. 
Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with a whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not utterly forsake me. Let us pray. Father, this morning we recognize that you call us, according to your standard, to walk with you. It's not what we accomplish through our own works. This is not a performance review that you call us to have. This is us recognizing that your way is the right way, submitting to you, Lord God, and saying, more of you, God, none of me. All of you, Lord God, is what we pray for today. Bring us into this time together. Bring us, Lord God, through the power of your Holy Spirit into the greater um, awareness of the fact that we need you every moment, every heartbeat, every breath. We need you. Help us, Father, as we sing the songs today, as we read the scriptures, as we approach you through prayer. Help us to remember that you have accomplished everything that you need to accomplish through Jesus, and that what you offer us now is your invitation to us to respond to your grace, to receive from you forgiveness, redemption, wholeness of life and spirit. You invite us, Lord God, into your presence. You invite us to share in your holiness. You invite us, Lord God, to walk in your uprightness and truth. Help us today, Lord God, to receive these things from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing hymn number 207. We have come to join in worship. have come to join in worship and adore the Lord our God. Let us come in prayer respecting God to speak his mighty word. All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Christians pray and holy manna will be showered all around. See them gather all around you, those he brought at such a cost. See the weary, see the hurting, see the lonely, see the lost. Be his hand and touch the needy, be his gospel, let it sound. Be his body, and sweet manna will be showered all around. Let us love our God supremely, let us love each other too. See the fearful life his people till our God makes all things new. Christ will call us home to heaven. At his banquet we'll sit down. Christ himself will rise and serve us, living manna all around. Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you, your son and your grandson, in all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you. 
a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and, and on your gates. Let's sing again, El Shaddai. Let's remain standing as we join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. As we approach that time where we pray for one another, we do have, of course, quite a number of needs within our local church body. Uh, if you received the uh, email this past week that had the, uh, had the prayer list attached to it, uh, you know, if you look through that, you know that there are quite a few things that we pray for on a regular basis. It seems like every week. Uh, one of the things that, that I found out about this week, and unfortunately uh, didn't get to Sam in time for the, the prayer list to go out, was uh, about the Macy's neighbor. Uh, I'm not going to 
let's just leave it at the Macy's neighbor for right now. We'll talk more about them Wednesday night. But uh, they have recently experienced a, a double loss. Uh, their family is mostly in the Philippines, and they've lost two family members due to COVID recently. Is that, is that right, March? Yes. So uh, continue to pray for, for the Macy's neighbor. Uh, another neighbor of the Macy's is, of course, Mary Oliver, and uh, Mary is still recuperating, recovering. Continue to pray for her as she recovers from her fall and from the, uh, uh, the, the things that she's been dealing with. So continue to pray for Mary, if you will. Uh, it seems like a lot of those things on the prayer list, we, we rarely get to really know everything that's going on. We put them on there, and it seems like, you know, sometimes they stay on there for, for a long time, and we don't always get updates or reports. I want to give you an update this morning on my friend Dustin. Uh, Dustin has been in ICU with, uh, with COVID for about two months now. Uh, I had a, a picture from his wife this past week. Uh, he was for the first time in two months on the edge of his bed and about to step up and use a walker to walk with. Uh, it's the first time he's been out of bed in two months or more. Uh, what an incredible testimony of the fact that God has brought Dustin uh, through this time. He's continuing to heal him. He still has um, a trach installed. He's still having to receive some help in his breathing, but for the most part, he's on his own. He's doing all the things that he needs to do, and he will soon be moved to another, um, to another facility for some more uh, treatment and some more physical therapy. So if you could please remember to pray for my friend Dustin and for his family as uh, the whole healing process continues to go on. Uh, just because those things have been on the prayer list for a while, it's easy to overlook them. It's easy just to read through them. But each of those names, each of those things represents a situation, kind of like for my friend. And sometimes it just takes a long time to, uh, uh, to bring someone through. It's incredible to me how God uses those times, that long span of time, to accomplish what God needs to accomplish. Um, sometimes it's for uh, a, a change in our lives, a change of our heart, a change of our attitude toward God, toward someone, a time of healing, a time of forgiveness that needs to happen. Sometimes it's, it's as God is working in, in us to bring about his healing through our bodies. I know that for those of you like Neil and, and some others, the Bowers had <laughs> kind of a, an illness situation this past week as well. But as God takes those times of illness and brings us back again to that point of remembrance that he is the God who heals as we sang in the song El Shaddai, we hear all of those names of God and all of those things about God. All of those names represent something about God's character. God Most High, God Almighty, is also the God who holds us, the God who heals us, the God who helps us, the God who loves us. Let us pray. Father, this morning as we go to prayers, we lift up to you the needs of this local congregation. First of all, we recognize that you alone our God. We recognize that you are the one who is able to work and to accomplish what you need to accomplish in each of us as individuals, in each of us as we are a part of this local church. We ask, Father, that you will accomplish today what you need to accomplish, not in our timing, not according to our will, but, Father, according to your will, according to to your timing. May you accomplish what you need to accomplish in this place, in each of us, through this local church, in this community. Use us, Father God, for your glory. Use us, Lord God, that, you're, that your name may be lifted up, that others who do not know you may come to know you and to see you through the witness of those who are here today. Father, we do pray for these needs that we've mentioned. We do pray for the Macy's neighbor. We ask, Father, that you will continue to touch and heal Mary and bring her back to, uh, to her strength, bring back to her her health again so that she can again come and be a part of our, uh, of our local fellowship. We do pray, Father, for, uh, for the Macy's other neighbors and ask that you will be with them and help them in every way as they deal with, uh, with the loss, the death of, uh, of these family members. Uh, literally half a world away, but Father, still hurting, still the grief 
that goes on because of, because of this death. We ask, Father, for your comfort for them this morning. We know that there are others in our congregation, Father, who continue to, uh, to need your healing touch, who are still going through those times of, of, uh, of, of crisis at times in their lives. We ask, Father, that through the midst of all of the struggles, all of the pain, all of the things that we face on a daily basis, we ask, Father, that you will speak your peace, bring your stillness, your calm assurance that you alone are God and that you alone are to be trusted. Hear us now as we join our hearts and our voices together, praying as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning from the Gospels comes from Mark. Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? Now, uh, let me explain something about that word first and the way it's used there. It refers to not just in the sequence, not just like number one, number two, number three, but it refers to first as in the top of the heap, the greatest, the one that we should all know, the one that we need to live by. Jesus answered, verse 29, Jesus answered him, the first, the greatest, the one that we need to live by of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is the Shema, the daily prayer of the Jewish people. Verse 30, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God. And there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength. And to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Let's stand together. Let's sing our next song together this morning, the family prayer song. Let's stand and sing. Come and fill our homes with your presence. You alone are worthy of our reverence. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Staying together, praying together. Trusting God's word, we need each other, brothers and mothers, sisters and brothers in our daily love. 
was for me and my house. We will serve the Lord as for me and my house. We will serve the Lord as for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Amen. You can be seated. On earth as it is in heaven. We've heard those words before, right? Of course we have. We said them just a little while ago. Well, technically, I know you're correcting me in your minds right now. What we said was in earth instead of on earth. We're used to hearing it sometimes in some of the more modern translations of the Lord's Prayer have it translated as on earth. But there's a good reason for our choice of preposition when we say in earth. You see, our prayer is for God to work in earth, in each of us who are formed of clay. As God works in us, then God's plan of redemption and freedom from sin is made evident to others around us. In this way, the evidence, the reality of God's kingdom is breaking into this world every day as God works in each of us. Well, let's get back to that, to that idea, to that phrase, on earth as in heaven. We can see evidence of God's presence everywhere around us. As the psalm writer is saying, the heavens declare the glory of God. It is utterly irrational to think that the world in which we live and the processes that are at work in this world, the seasons, the weather, uh, the water cycle, if you want to talk about those things, it's impossible to believe that all of those things happened by accident. The evidence that we see around us in creation, in the world, is the evidence of God the Creator at work. Every part of this creation, every process that God has put in place, all of it points us back again to God. Unfortunately, there are many people who willfully choose to ignore the rational argument for God's creative power. Why? Why do they make this choice? Because to admit that God is the creator means that we must admit that God is God and we are not. And if God is God and I am not God, then my life has been affected and infected by sin. Try as I might, there's nothing I can do to solve my own sin problem. Only God has the plan to remove sin, sins, and sinning from God's creation. But instead of surrendering to God, many people would rather ignore the sin problem and fall back on the worship of nature or the worship of self or any other idol that they can find to set up in their life. Preacher, why? I thought we were in a series on Hebrews. Why are we talking about all of this stuff this morning? Well, because all of this leads us right back into Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9 is, I hate to say the heart of the sermon here, or the heart of the letter, uh, because I feel like I've said that just about every week as we've been preaching through this. But Hebrews chapter 9 captures this idea that would have been so important to these people who are hearing this sermon or reading this letter. It captures this idea, and it brings them back to this point of recognition that God has established something on earth that is a reflection of God's reality in God's presence in eternity. You see, when God established among the Hebrew people what proper worship of God was, God gave certain earthly symbols and rituals that reminded the people that sin separated humanity from God and reminded the people that God's way of living was the best way. Throughout all 
of the Old Testament when we read, whether it's in Genesis, starting in chapter 3, or all the way through to the, to the words of God to the people through the prophets, we keep hearing that same thing over and over again. My people are to walk in my path. When my people do not walk in my path, it is the pathway that leads to death. It is the pathway that leads to darkness. God's way, God's path, the life that he calls us to live, is the way that leads to life. The only way. All of these earthly symbols, all of these rituals, though, provided no cure for sin. It highlighted the fact that sin was a problem, but it offered no solution to the problem. This is the message we hear today from Hebrews, this sermon letter that we've been working our way through for the last several weeks. Everything that's been said so far leads us to what we hear today in Hebrews chapter 9. Let's read this section. That were, it's divided into two parts for us this morning. The first section is Hebrews 9, starting in verse 11. <clears throat> but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That last phrase there, Jack, will you go back and put that last verse that has verse 14 up there. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We, we mentioned this, I want to come back and mention just briefly this phrase, dead works, because we talked about it a few weeks ago. I want to make sure that that you have this right idea in your mind. The dead works, or the works that lead to death, is another way of understanding what that phrase means in Greek. And it simply is the things that we do outwardly, but that don't affect our spiritual broken condition. Does that make sense? Because there are lots of things that we can do outwardly that never touch our heart. I believe the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 would say it this way, if I, if I gave all that I own to the poor, if I let myself be cut to ribbons as a martyr for the cause, but my life didn't reflect the love of God, then my words are nothing but noise. My life is meaningless. If God has not brought about God's change inwardly in our life, then nothing outwardly that we do will be glorifying to God. Those are the dead works that the preacher is talking about here. Those things that we do, and we say, well, I'm, I'm a good person because I go to church, because I put money in the, in the offering basket, because, because I pray for people, because I do this. I'm a good person. At least I'm better than those people over there, because they're not even doing that. The question is not a measurement of how good we are compared to another person. The question is, as we've already seen this morning in the scriptures that we read, the question is, compared to God's standard, As God reveals himself to us, how do we measure up? And the question is, pitifully. Because only God can bring about the change that needs to be brought about inwardly before anything that we do outwardly stops being a dead work. See, there are works that lead to life. And those works are the ones that come about because God has, first of all, brought about a change in in us spiritually. All right, thank you, Jack. You can move back. If we thought that we were unfamiliar, this whole passage here talks about sacrifice and blood and goats and calves and sprinklings and ashes and all of these things. And if we thought we were unfamiliar when we talked about the office of the high priest a few weeks ago, (laughs) we're lost when it comes to understanding, for us to understand or to talk about 
the system of sacrifice that occurred in the Jewish temple. Let me give you a, a very brief synopsis here. When the Jewish temple on the, Jew, on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, it brought an end to the Jewish sacrificial system. You can't have sacrifices if you don't have a temple. If you don't have a place where the sacrifices are offered. With the system gone, there had to have been many people who thought that there was now no way for sins to be covered. But wait, the preacher in Hebrews argues, there is a way. The old system was inadequate. It's okay, the preacher is saying, it's okay that the old system is gone because the old system was inadequate to fully meet the spiritual needs of humanity. The system of sacrifice, like the office of high priest in the tabernacle or the temple, which are talked about in chapter 8, all of those things are just simply shadows or hints of what is real. All of these things are simply earthly examples of God's eternal reality. The earthly things were a shadow of what God is truly doing to redeem creation from the power of sin and to restore creation to relationship with God. To see how inadequate the sacrificial system was, we need to back up just a little bit and to look at one of the Jewish holy days, and that would be the Day of Atonement. It's this day that's being described by the preacher in the verses immediately before what we just read. There's a lot going on in what I'm about to tell you. Forgive me if I rush through these things, and if you want more information, please catch me later. But let me give you just a, a, that very brief synopsis of what happened on the Day of Atonement, and this one of the Jewish high holy days. First of all, the high priest would sacrifice a young bull. And it was very, you have to understand what the sacrifice was. It was, it was meant to atone for the unintentional sins that he and his family may have committed in the previous year. We prayed this already this morning in the Lord's Prayer. Let's go back to that a minute again. Remember, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We've said before that those trespasses are those unintentional sins, those things that we may have said uh, on the side to someone or we may have said in such a way that it, that it hurt someone unintentionally. We didn't mean to do that. We didn't mean to hurt someone. We didn't mean to do something that would have caused them to look away from God. But perhaps we did. So we ask God, forgive us of those trespasses. Forgive us for those unintentional sins. This Day of Atonement was the acting out of what we pray every Sunday. And so the first sacrifice that was done that day was the sacrifice of a young bull. And the priest then took a bowl of blood from the bull, entered into the Holy of Holies, and applied that blood to the mercy seat, to that part of the Ark of the Covenant that was called the mercy seat. This, remember, is a sacrifice that he made for himself and for his family first. Then after that, after that sprinkling of blood, the priest came back out. He sacrificed a goat. And he went back into the Holy of Holies again with that blood sacrifice. And again, he sprinkled it on the mercy seat and he prayed, God, forgive our nation. Our nation which is to be an example of you to the world. Our nation which is to be your holy people in this world. Our nation which is to be that group of people through whom you work through whom your truth is revealed. Forgive us for the ways that we have wronged each other and wronged you. Forgive us for all of those things. That was the second sacrifice that was made that day. The first was the bull offered for himself and the family. The second was the goat offered for the unintentional sins that the people had committed against God and against each other for that previous year. Then he comes back out and there's a second goat And he goes over to the second goat and he lays his hand on that goat's head. And he prays and he says, take all of our sins, Lord God, and lay them upon this animal. And may this animal bear the weight and the burden of our sins. And then that animal was driven off away from the other people, driven off into the wilderness, never to be seen again. You know what that animal was called? was the scapegoat. Ever heard that term before? 
Perhaps somebody's made you that. The scapegoat was that thing. And interestingly enough, the, the, that idea, all of this shows up throughout the, the New Testament, except for that idea of scapegoat. And I'm not sure why. Somebody should probably write a paper. Someone much smarter than me has probably written a book and a paper on that. But for whatever reason, I can't find anything about that particular thing. In all of the sacrificing, in all of this ritual that occurred on this day, there was no provision made for intentional sins. I want you to think about that. All those times where there was an intentional sin, where you knew what was right, and you chose to do what was wrong. In the Old Testament, there's one example who comes to mind, a person who should come to mind immediately when we talk about that, and that should be David. David. Who knew that it was wrong to even look at the wife of Uriah, even to look at Bathsheba, and yet he looked, and he kept looking. And that lingering glance turned into something far more until there was not only until lust had been brought to, uh, to full measure and it became sin, and that sin then spilled over into the sin of not only adultery but murder. And all of the things that occurred there, all of David's intentional sinning, there was no way that the Day of Atonement covered for that because the Day of Atonement was only meant to cover unintentional sins. That's just not me making that up. It says very clearly in what we read. These were sins committed unintentionally. The system of sacrifice showed our need for God. But it could never cleanse that root of sin. That absence of relationship with God. The system of sacrifice could never do that. It would show us that we needed a Savior. And it could show us that God was not finished yet. And so there was always the hope, there was always the prayer that God's plan would be brought to completion. That God would break the power of sin once and for all. And God did that. And He did that in such a way that the yearly need for additional sacrifice was done away with. It was no longer needed, as the preacher in Hebrews argues, because it was inadequate. It did not meet the full thing that needed to be met. And God's plan was then brought to its completion through Jesus. The priesthood of Jesus then, the sacrifice that Jesus brings, is that which not only takes care of unintentional sins, but also is the cure for our our separation from God, our lack of relationship with God, and also that which can atone for intentional sinning. We see all of this back in verse 11. Jesus has, through His submitted life and through His obedient death, provided the sacrifice that does more then cover up unintentional sin. Jesus' sacrifice cleanses from all sin, and it breaks the power of sin that separated us from God in the first place. Jesus' sacrifice was offered according to the eternal reality and not through the earthly shadow. Because Jesus' sacrifice is offered and accepted in a way that no earthly sacrifice could be, everything changed. A new possibility emerged. And that new possibility is found in verse 12. And verse 12 introduces us to this new part of God's plan, redemption. Up to this point, the word redemption has not been said by the preacher in Hebrews. The Greek word that's translated as redemption carried a very powerful image with it. The word means literally ransom, a ransom paid, or a purchase price. For the people in this church who were of Jewish descent, the word uh, redemption 
would have immediately brought to mind God's work of delivering the Hebrew people from slavery and bondage and suffering in Egypt when they were Pharaoh's slaves. For the non-Jewish people in this church, they would have thought about how this word redemption was used when a slave was able to save up enough money to purchase his or her freedom. Now, since banks weren't really an option for slaves, pagan temples would serve as places where money could be safely held. And upon saving and collecting enough money over the years, the slave and then the slave owner, owner were called in before the, the priests in this pagan temple, and the money that had been saved was then paid to the slave owner. Legal paperwork was drawn up stating that the slave was now free, and the legal paperwork always stated not that the slave had done this work of saving all this money, but that it was the pagan god, the false god of whatever temple was represented who had set this slave free. The preacher makes it clear that there is no false god involved in God's plan. Jesus was the sacrifice which paid the price for redemption and opened the way for freedom and forgiveness to be offered. The price has been paid and the work has been accomplished by God for humanity to be set free from slavery and suffering under the power of sin. As exciting as all of this talk about redemption is, there's one more element to Jesus' sacrifice that we have to bring into account before we can move on and finish up this section in the book of Hebrews. This last section here is found in, in our concluding verses in chapter 9, starting in verse 15. And for this reason, for the reason that Jesus has become our sacrifice, that he has paid the redemption price the ransom price. For this reason, He is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in fact is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no possibility of the forgiveness of sins. Verse 23, Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. There's a lot to unpack in this section. One of the things that, that I need to mention briefly is the idea that, again, we see the inadequacy of the things of this earth compared to the perfection of the eternal that God has established. One of the things that is drawn to our attention in this long passage is the idea of separation from God. It was only the high priest and only one day a year that the high priest could go through the holy place where they were every day 
into the holy of holies, into that one place where there was the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat of God. Only one day a year could we enter, or could the high priest enter into the very presence of the holy God. We have already been told by this preacher that God invites us through Jesus to come boldly before the throne of grace, to come boldly into the very presence of the holy God. This is the invitation, and this is the completion of what Jesus has done by entering in as our sacrifice into the holy of holies, the heavenly holy of holies. When we talk about redemption, when we talk about new covenant, there is a verse that always comes to my mind. Jeremiah was shown by God a time when God would make a new covenant with God's people. We can read that promise in Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God told Jeremiah that a time will come when God's people will be known by how God is cleansing and redeeming their minds and spirits from the power of sin. God's law will not be an outward burden to live under, but an inward release that brings wholeness, joy, and peace. The time has come for God's promise to Jeremiah to be fulfilled, the preacher proclaims. There is a new covenant, and this new covenant between God and humanity has been brought about through Jesus' sacrifice. And since Jesus is high priest after the order of Melchizedek, this application of God's provision is offered to those who are hearing this good news now, all who will hear it in the future, and all who will choose to hear it in the past. God, through Jesus, is bringing the reality of heaven to earth. May God's kingdom come, and may God's will come be done. This morning as we close our service together, we celebrate communion. We recognize that this is a time of remembrance and a time of reflection. We remember that Jesus' life and death, resurrection and ascension provides all we need to be set on God's right path. We recognize that there are times where we unintentionally say, do, act, in a way that does not bring glory to God. So as we prepare for communion, we remember again the prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But we also remember that God has provided that sacrifice, that one through whom our sins are forgiven, our sins are washed white as snow, through which God's law is put in our minds that God's truth is written on our hearts, that the glory of God is seen through our lives to those who are around us. And God makes us His people as we choose for Him to be our God. God has done everything, everything that we could not do to destroy the power of sin and to cancel power of sin over us in our lives. God's requirement to receive this gift is that we respond to God's grace. So this morning, we prepare our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our lives to receive what God has already offered. First with prayer, and then with song. Let us pray. Father, this morning, hear our prayer. Work in this place, among this people, in us, draw us to you. Forgive us, Lord God, for those things which we have done unintentionally to harm you, to harm others. Thank you, Lord God, that you are offering the provision through Jesus that we can also come to you and receive from you forgiveness for those things that we have done intentionally to be set right with you, to be put back on the right path. Lord, there is nowhere else that we can look except to you for forgiveness, for redemption, for wholeness, and for peace. Thank you, God. Thank you.
that you are the one who hears our prayer. Receive now, Father, this song. Hear our prayer to you. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together. We'll sing hymn number 336. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood loose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains the dying three rejoice to see that fountain in his there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. All a ransomed church of God be said to sin no more. Erst by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing words apply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die, and shall be till I die and shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. When this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Jack, keep that slide up. We look forward to the day. When indeed, this poor, lisping, stammering tongue will be able to sing in God's presence. And to rejoice in the fact that God's power to save is a reality in which we live. But that reality, we get the taste of it now, here, in this life, as we receive from God His grace, as we recognize that His alone is the power to forgive sins, to restore relationship to himself and to one another. On the night of his arrest and his betrayal, Jesus in the upper room with his disciples took the bread. And during the meal, he broke the bread and he said, this bread represents my body, which will soon be broken for you. As often as you eat of it, remember me. Take Following the cup, or following the meal, he lifted the cup. And he said, This cup represents my blood, my blood which will soon be shed for the forgiveness of your sins. This, friends, is the sacrifice. This is what brings mercy with God. This is what brings wholeness and forgiveness and redemption to our lives.
Let us pray. Father, you see in us that which you desire to redeem. Not because we are so great in ourselves, but because we are so lost apart from you. Your love, Lord God, has provided everything that is necessary. Your love brings us to this point, Father, of recognition that you have done everything. The grace that you now offer to us, Lord God, I pray that we will respond to and receive your grace, your offer, that our lives may be changed, that we may recognize, Lord God, that you are the Redeemer, that you are the Rescuer, that you are the one who has paid the ransom, and that our lives are set free from the power of sin so that we might live in your power, in the power of your glory, the power of your holiness. In Jesus' name. missed.